meeting. Um, so we will record it for those who can't join, for those who join late and they want to catch, you know, catch up on anything that they missed. Um, so we have a wonderful guest this evening. Um, Joe Forte is here and he's going to do the presentation this evening. And to get started, um, first, I'm going to have everyone just say their name and where they're from. And then I will hand it over to Dion. So Tina, we can start with you. Okay, I'm Tina Kelly. I own Crystal Carriage Concierge and I'm in Melbourne, Florida. Thank you. Justin? Justin Fouth with Pelican New Orleans and Cajun Encounters Tours and we're in New Orleans, Louisiana. Madali. Madali Finstead from Salt Lake City. I'm a personal concierge. All right, it looks like Marjorie is logging in now. We'll see if we can get her in quickly. We'll see, well, Dion, we'll have you go ahead and um, I'll hand it off to you and you can uh, do our introductions. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Dion Bright. I'm with the Philadelphia Tri-State Chapter and I work with Joe Forte, who is the security director at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, Penn Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Joe has been gracious enough to join us this evening and is going to present to us on workplace security. So thank you, Joe, and take it away. Hey, thanks, Dion. And th thank you all for inviting me. I'm gonna share my screen here. Has everybody seen the screen, workplace violence? Yes. Good. And if I can move, to, uh, here we go. So NIOSH defines workplace violence as, and I, I need to move this screen here. Hold on for one second. Okay. NIOSH defines workplace violence as the act of a threat of violence ranging from verbal abuse to a physical assault directed towards people at work or on duty. Workplace violence is also, also may include acts that result in damage to an organization's resources or capability. Many employers consider workplace harassment and bullying to be forms of workplace violence as well. Also included in this context is domestic violence that spills over into the workplace in the form of assaults, threats, or other actions by outside parties with whom employees have relationships that occur at the workplace. There are five types of workplace violence incidents, and we'll quickly go through these. Type one is criminal intent. Criminal intent workplace violence and incidents is when the perpetrator has no relationship with the targeted establishment, and the primary motive is theft. This type is generally a robbery, shoplifting, or trespassing incident that turns, turns violent. The biggest targets of criminal intent violence are workers who exchange cash, work late hours, or work alone. Type two, customer client. During a customer client workplace violence incident, the perpetrator is a customer or a client of the employer and the violence often occurs in conjunction with the worker's normal duties. The occupations with the highest risk for customer client violence are healthcare and social service workers whom are four times more likely to be the victim than the average private sector employee, according to the Bureau of Labor Stats. Type three, worker to worker. This type of workplace violence incident is generally perpetrated by a current or former employee. And the motivating factor is often interpersonal or work-related conflicts or losses and traumas. The group highest at risk for this type of workplace violence incident is managers and supervisors. Type four, domestic violence. Domestic violence is the workplace oftentimes is perpetrated by someone who is not an employee or a former employee. 
This type of incident is frequent because the abuser knows exactly where his or her spouse will be during work hours. Women are targeted much more frequently than men, and the risk of violence increases when one party attempts to separate from the other. I know where, where I work at Penn Medicine, we, we experience domestic problems. And, you know, we, we tell our employees, you know, your, 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 your boyfriend, husband, ex-husband, you don't have to, you don't have to go home that night, but they know you go to work and you have to support yourself. So there is, we want our staff to let us know, let security know if there is problems. So we could work with them, make sure they get a, 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 an abuse order, a restraining order. Uh, and we work very closely with them to make sure that we're aware because it could spill over into the work environment which it, a lot of times it does. Type five, ideological violence. Ideological workplace violence is directed at an organization, its people and or property for ideological, religious or political reasons. The violence is perpetrated by extremists and value-driven groups justified by their beliefs. Many of the recent active shooter and terrorist incidents across the globe fall under this bucket. Security departments serve to provide a framework to promote a secure environment for all people interacting within the facility and to provide appropriate resource protection. Um, it identifies established policies, programs, processes used by the facility to establish, support, train, and maintain an effective security management program. Some of the fundamentals a visible security presence helps reduce crime and it increases a feeling of security within the institution. The assessment of risk to identify potential problems is central to reducing crime, injury, and other incidents. Analysis of security incidents provides information to predict and prevent crime, injury, and other incidents. Training staff is critical to ensuring their performance. Staff is trained to recognize and report either potential or actual incidents to ensure a timely response. Staff in sensitive areas are trained about the protective measures designed for those areas and their responsibilities to assist in the protection of all. Violence in the workplace is a growing problem. It is necessary to develop a program to address workplace violence. I, I know in hospital, in the hospital settings, you know, uh, one of the things when you look at violence, and threats and assaults. You know, believe it or not, in a hospital, you could add all the assaults, both, both verbal abuse and physical assaults, add them all up in all the different industries, whether it's police, prison systems, taxi cab drivers, um, fast food restaurants, add all those incidents up, compare them to healthcare incidents, and healthcare will beat them. That's how many incidents happen at healthcare today. I can tell you, I, I, I've been doing this for 40 years, working in healthcare security. And I, you know, we have something called the Joint Commission that will come and, and they, they, they will credit the facility. And I've been involved in 11 Joint Commission surveys. Every three years, they come to the facility and, and they'll survey the facility. And I can tell you, secure, my department, we will have information, all the things that we're doing, and the surveyors will come in here and they don't even, they don't even look at our paperwork. They really have it. Just recently, they are because of the amount of incidents that are happening. You know, in 2012 and in 2016, the Joint Commission put out something called the Sentinel event. And they're asking staff in hospitals to report incidents of violence and incidents of assaults. For years, hospital employees just felt, well, this is a part of our job. I'm a nurse, a patient could hit me, spit on me, curse me out. It's just a part of my job. And it's not, it's not a part of your job. You know, there is probably a small percentage 
where if a, if a patient is coming under, coming out of anesthesia and kicks and hits you, you know, those type of things could be explainable, but not, not what's happening today in this environment. Um, w- w- these things need to be reported so we can come up with programs that are going to stop this. At-risk job situations. Certain job situations pose higher risk of workplace violence than others. Delivering of passengers, goods, or services. Involving the exchange of money. Involving mobile workplace assignments. Working with unstable people, and that's healthcare, social service, or criminal justice settings. Working alone is a concern. And I'm sure some of the concierge in, in here, they do work alone. They work late at night. Uh, some in, could be in a high crime area, uh, guarding valuable property or possessions uh, in a location with uncontrolled public access. These are all high risk areas of jobs. Verbal abuse and bullying, one of the most common types of workplace violence. Only reported around 30%, only around 30% of the time, employees will report this. Uh, some of this abuse is blaming people, excessive or unproductive criticisms, gaslighting, causing self-doubt, or threatening people. Harassment and sexual assault. Approximately 40 to 70% of women and 13 to 30% of men have experienced some form of sexual harassment or assault at work. Frequency varies by career type, frequently results in the development of PTSD, following severe cases of sexual assault. Women are victim of approximately 80% of the sexual harassment and assaults. Vulgar or inappropriate jokes, unwanted requests for dates or advances, and quid pro quo. Physical assaults and anger-related incidents. Assaults are the fourth leading cause of death in the workplace occurs between coworkers or worker client interactions, 20,000 injuries and 392 fatalities as a result of workplace violence in 2020 alone. Over 80% of the active shooter situations occur at work. And you can see on the right side, intentional shooting by another person, stabbing, cutting, slashing, hitting, kicking, beating, or shoving, uh, strangulation, bombing and arson, rape, sexual assault, threats and verbal assault. All these things do happen in the workplace and you have to know that. You know, again, you know, referring to the hospital, um, I'll give you an example of a situation that happened around four years ago. We we, we had this nurse that was working in the emergency room and it was three o'clock in the morning and the trauma bay where she was working, she was stocking supplies. And the trauma bay was basically empty except for one person that was brought in by the police. And she was a woman who was under the influence. She was laying on a stretcher, you know, trying to sleep it off. And now these, these three trauma bays are under camera surveillance. It's not security cameras. They're, they're actually, we're a teaching hospital. So these cameras are there to teach nurses and doctors when a trauma patient comes in. So this nurse, three o'clock in the morning, is you know stocking supplies, and all of a sudden you could see when we reviewed the cameras, this woman who's laying down is starting to wake up, and you see her shaking a little bit, and then all of a sudden she starts to get up and get on her feet, and you can tell she's a little bit wobbly, and she's you know, walking like Frankenstein towards this nurse. I mean, if you had horror music, you could put horror music to it as well. And she takes steps towards her. She grabs the nurse in a bear hug. And you see her, you, you, you see the uh, the patient bending her, bending her head to the side. And she just rips around four inches of skin from this nurse's neck, just bites it bites her neck and tears, tears the skin apart. Um, she quickly hit a, a nurse call button 
to, uh, to, to get staff over there. Staff came, the helper and his sister. And she was out for probably around three weeks. And, and when she came back to work, to, it, it, she, she gave me a call and she wanted to review the video. And she wanted to see it. And what was interesting when I started to speak with her, and, and number one, you never blame the victim. You just never blame the victim. And she was like apologizing to me and saying, you know, Joe, I, you know, I didn't, I, I felt this person was, was, was not stable on the ground when she grabbed me and I'm a nurse and she, she was the patient. And if I would have kicked her or elbowed her away from me, she could have fell and got hurt. And I was concerned. I didn't want to do that. I'm a nurse. And, you know, what we tell our staff is you defend yourself. That's the bottom line. You need to defend yourself. If you elbow, kick the person away from you, you do that. Now, if the person's on the ground and you kick them 35 times, that's a little too excessive. You don't want to do that. But you want to defend yourself. Break away from that. Don't let them injure you. You know, we had another incident on the ninth floor where a patient who had psychological problems wandered into a pantry on the floor and he was behind the door and he had it, he had his oxygen with him and the tubing with oxygen going, going through his nose. A nurse walks in to the pantry, doesn't realize he's behind the door and the patient just grabs the tubing and starts to wrap it around her neck to choke her out. The nurse fought. The nurse, the nurse was able to escape that, which was good, you know, but you're dealing with all kinds of physical assaults, no matter where you were. And the bottom line is you have to defend yourself. Don't think oh, I'm going to get fired. If I, if I hurt somebody, I'm going to get sued. No, you, you defend yourself. Someone, someone get, invade your personal space. You know, it's, it's all about making sure you defend yourself. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on when we talk about active shooter. Theft property damage. Employees, customers can steal from companies in many ways. Theft of services, of data, of money, of personal items. Theft of the time clock. Um, damage of property without fixing the things, a broken table destroyed office spaces, broken mirrors, wall damage. We see that. It, it, it could be just regular property damage. It could be sabotage. It could be a, a, an employee who's upset at something, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix them, and I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to break this. I'm going to break. I'm going to throw the coffee machine on the ground because they're not supplying the, 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 the brand of coffee that I want. And so you have all different kind of reasons why people will do things. Pranks. Pranks in the workplace can cause a lot of problems. And I could tell you in my security department, um, a few years back, we, we had a bunch of pranksters that will do things. And uh, we had to put a stop to that because you never know what's going to happen. Um, they cause problems. Uh, someone gets upset, people humiliated or embarrassed. Um, a person, single or multiple people, could be injured. People can be fired. Example: pulling a chair out from beneath someone. I mean, I when when I put my foot down in my department, that's what it was. We had one of our officers um, pull a chair out from somebody, and, and it was on camera. And the person went down, uh, injured his back, and uh, that's something that you just can't. That's got to stop. And you know, silly things like the kick me sign or marbles on the floor, pranks involving people's personal belongings. You know, you see that picture of someone put sod and grass up on somebody's desk. You know, it, 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 it can result, you know, it could be funny, but you know, people get offended, especially when you touch their, per, touch their personal items or, their, or, or their, their items at work. And it, it could be a problem. It really could be. So you, you want to try to avoid that. Major causes of workplace violence, you know, stress, you know, uh, COVID in March, April, May of 2020, um, there is so much stress right now. And it's still, it's still prevalent. It, it, it's still here. 
and we see a lot more violence. I mean, the city of Philadelphia is, is out of control. I don't know if you, the people down in Florida and people in Utah, I don't know if you, if you watch the news at all with Philadelphia, Philadelphia is out of control with the amount of shootings that are taking place. I mean, we, we are averaging six to eight people being shot per day. One, two, three people dead per day. I mean, that's how bad it is right now in Philadelphia. Carjackings. I mean, it's not just they're stealing the car from somebody. They're killing you, too. They pull you out of the car, they shoot you, then they take your car away from you. I mean, Philadelphia is really bad right now. It's a lot of concerns. Um, in the hospital, we're seeing a lot of employees are... And we have a zero tolerance on weapons being introduced in our facility. And we are hearing and seeing people bringing guns into the hospital. Uh, we had an incident last weekend where a nurse walks into a restroom and there's a firearm on top of the toilet paper dispenser. And then we later found out it was an employee who went to the bathroom and left their gun in there. Um, that person was, was terminated the same day. I mean, it was good. The employee actually contacted security and said they lost their gun. Um, but we already had the gun in our possession by that time, but it, it, it's just a lot of, a lot of, and, and that causes a lot of stress, lack of background checks, you know, you know, places need to do background checks to make sure the people that they're hiring, uh, don't have a criminal history of violence. Employees feel underappreciated, being laid off or fired, unresolved issues between coworkers, unresolved issues between employer and employee. I can tell you just, just today, I, I, I get a call from our HR department asking for a well being check of, one, of, of an employee of Penn Medicine. And the well-being check, we, you know, we're the conduit between, between the hospital and the police department. So we will contact the police and uh, to have an officer go to a home to check on somebody. Um, it just so happened today, I was very close to the area where we, we needed to check on an employee. I was 10 minutes away. So I said, I, I'll go there and, and, and see if I could talk to this individual. And it was an employee who, was, who got into an argument with, with their manager yesterday and just left and did not report being off today. And so they were concerned for his well being. And so I went there, I actually spoke with his father. He was admitted to a psychiatric facility last night. So we're, we're happy he's seeking help, this individual. But when you're talking about unresolved issues between employer and employee, you know, after speaking with the father, the father said the reason why he's so upset is because he was supposed to, he, he's due overtime from many months during COVID where he was working from home. And so, and HR is working on that and, and, and they're, they're, they're going to give it to him, but that is something that you have to communicate. It's an unresolved issue, and that could turn into violence in the workplace. Violent prevention programs, the building blocks for developing an effective workplace violence prevention programs include management committees and employee participation, work site analysis, hazard prevention and control, safety and health training, and record keeping and program evaluations. You know, hospitals always had something like this, but it really is, we're getting more and more departments involved in, in these, and, and they're, they're committed to workplace violence right now. And so um, it is really an exciting time for a director of security to be able to meet with these, all these various different groups and come up with crime prevention programs and hazard prevention. So. It, 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 even though we're seeing a lot of problems, uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're trying to address these things and hopefully we're going we're gonna to see positive results from that. Workplace adaptions to minimize risk, engineering control, 
Strategic include using physical barriers such as enclosures or security officers or door locks to reduce employee exposures to the hazard. Metal detection systems, you know, um, at, at, at every Penn Medicine Hospital, we have a metal detection and an x-ray machine at every entrance to the emergency room. We see a lot more problems in our emergency room, but you know, when like like for example, at HUP, we we keep track of all the weapons that we take, and we average around six to eight firearms per month that people are coming into the hospital, and then we will secure them in a in a handgun weapon lockup. One of the great things we have is Penn Police. We call Penn Police; they will run a check to make sure that their permit to carry that firearm is valid. Um, and, and so um, our ED is safe, but when you look at those numbers, now th that's six to eight firearms a month, but we average around 260 weapons a month. That's knives, uh, tools, forks, you know, anything that could be classified as a weapon, we will take it from people and secure it. Um, and so when you see numbers like that, just imagine the people that aren't going to the emergency room. What kind of weapons do they have coming in to visit a patient? And so that is another concern. And one of the things that we are looking at is another system called Evolve. And that is a weapons detection system, not metal detection, but weapons. And it, it, you walk through a unit, just like a metal detector, and it will, it will sense the form of a gun, the form of a knife. And it will alarm at that point. And we are using it at one of our sister hospitals right now. It's working great. And I think eventually uh, all the hospitals in our, in our health system will probably get this Evolve system. I mean, at Disney World down Florida, they, they just, uh, they just uh, signed a contract with Evolve. And they're, they're going to be getting that system. Many, many sports facilities are getting them. Uh, so it really is a state-of-the-art system. Panic alarms or duress alarms, you know, strategically placing them throughout your facility um, and, and train the staff on how to utilize those, those devices. Uh, better or additional lighting is always a, a plus in minimizing violence. And more accessible exits. Are, are there any, any questions at all with workplace, that workplace violence before we get into active threat planning and response? I could answer anything you want. Okay, let, 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 let me get into active threat planning and response. An active threat profile. An active threat profile is an individual actively engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined or populated area. In most cases, active shooters use firearms and there's no pattern or method to the selection of their victims. Active threat situations are unpredictable and evolve very quickly. Typically, the immediate deployment of law enforcement is required to stop the shooting and to mitigate harm to victims. Because active threat situations are often over within 10 to 15 minutes before law enforcement arrives onto the scene, individuals like yourself must be prepared both mentally and physically to deal with the active shooter situation. Chaos, panic, all could be eliminated with training and, and, and the training, and that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're sitting down, you're, you're in a comfortable, safe location, and we're talking about what to do in the event of an active shooter situation. And you don't wanna wait until you're involved in that situation because there is gonna be a lot of panic and fear. Um, so you, you wanna come, come up with a game plan. So a, a quick look at, between 2000 and 2018, active shooter incidents in the US. 
there were 277. Most of them happened in the commerce or the business sector. And then you see education around 20%. And a lot of times when I, when I meet with our staff in healthcare, I will shoot down to healthcare and 4.3% or 12 incidents in an 18 year period of time. And I will tell our staff, well, you're probably sitting there saying, Joe, why are we even talking about this? 12 incidents in 18 years? Isn't there another crime that's more valid that we could talk about? And understand active shooter situations, these are, these are identified by the FBI. And they identify if three or more people are killed, they will classify it as an active shooter incident. I'll give you an example. There was a hospital in Chicago two Christmases ago where the husband or the ex-husband of a doctor uh, was waiting in the parking lot for, her, for his wife to come in or ex-wife to come in. He gets out of the car when she approaches. He then fires two shots at her, hits her in the shoulder. She was able to escape and she ran into the hospital and she was and she was saved at that point. But he then followed her. And there was a 26 year old pharmacy tech that started I think around two weeks at that facility. She just so happened to be getting off the elevator and he is shooting down the hallway and she was struck and she was killed. And a responding Chicago police officer was killed as well. And so with that incident, it wouldn't even be classified as an active shooter because only two people were killed. When we, when we look at hospitals, in the last four years, there were over 650 shootings that have taken place in a hospital. They didn't result in three or more people being killed, but there were shootings that took place and people were injured. And so hospitals do see it and other locations do see it as well. So you need to be prepared. And, and, and the preparation is, and hopefully you heard this before, it's run, hide, fight. Those are the three things you want to remember in an active shooter situation. So let, 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 let's go quickly go through all three of these. Run. When an active shooter is in your vicinity, if you can get out, you get out. And I'm going to give you a couple of homework assignments tonight. One is wherever you work, look where your exits are. It's good for a fire too. If there's a fire, you... you you know how to get out, but if you hear shots fired, you escape. You know, know where you're going at that point. Escape. Now, in a, in a hospital setting, it, this is one of the things that we need to tell our nurses and our doctors because they, they'll say the same thing when I'm doing this training. I can't leave my patients behind. It's, it's a law. I can't do that. You know, in a fire situation, I could see, yes. You know, if there's a fire, hospitals, buildings are all designed to withstand two hours of a fire. There are smoke compartments. There are sprinkler heads. There are, there, there are all things to help get people out quickly, you know, and, and, and get them out before they could be injured. And, and so, you know, there's, all, there's that RACE acronym which, and the R doesn't stand for run, it stands for rescue. And that's the first thing you wanna do if there's a fire. But in an active shooter situation, it's different. You hear shots fired, you get out of there. That's, that's your responsibility. Your first responsibility is yourself at that point. Now, you know how to get out. You know different exits because you're, you, you've trained on, on, on doing this. And if there are visitors near you, coworkers, Grab, come, come with me, follow me. If they hesitate and they don't want to go, you leave them there and you get out of there. Leave your belongings behind. Don't go back and get your hand back, get your coat to go out. You know, what you're going to find, and, and, and you see it all the time when you watch the news of an active shooter situation, you'll see people leaving the area with their hands up in the air open palms. The police want to see that. They don't want to see anything in your possession. And 
we're talked about there's going to be fear, there's going to be panic. You know, think of the police officer too. They're not robots, the police officers. And, you know, they get scared as well. And so think of a, an officer who's riding around a mall and there's a, a shooting taking place at, at the movie theater at the mall. And that officer is, is arriving there at a high rate of speed. Their adrenaline is pumping. They pull in front of that theater and they, they open the trunk and they get their long rifle out. And they're pointing that rifle at everybody who's leaving that facility. They don't know who the shooter is at that point. If you're approaching with a bag, a handbag, a backpack, they are going to tell you to drop it. You know, you know, your belongings, you can run faster without it, number one. And number two, you're going to be told to drop it. They don't want to see anything coming at them. And the police are trained that way. And they will tell you to drop those items. Call 911 when it's safe to do so. You know, everybody has a cell phone, you know, but don't have the cell phone in your hand. Put it in your pocket. When it's safe to do so, call 911. If the police aren't there, get them there as soon as possible. It doesn't matter if, 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 if 80 people call, that's good too. It's telling the police that there's a serious situation that's happening. But avoid walking out with that in your hand because the police could see that in your hand. They could think you have a handgun in your hand and you, you possibly could be leaving that area and the officer is saying, drop the weapon, drop the weapon. And you're walking out. You think someone next to you has a gun, but they're talking about you because you have a cell phone in your hand. So keep that in your pocket. Also, people want to record everything for social media. And just think about it. If, if there's an sh active shooter going on and the police respond to an area, all the cars are out front and someone leaves that area and now they're trying to record the police in front of that building. You know what that looks like to a police officer? It looks like that person may have a gun and is pointing a gun at them. So do not do that either. You know, quickly go to a safe location, listen to the police, what they say and follow their direction. Hide. If you can't run, you're trapped in a certain area. You want to hide. Lock yourself into a room. Blockade the door. If you're in a conference room, grab the chairs, the tables, put them up against the door. So it'll take time for that shooter to get in there. Those extra seconds for that person to get to you could be the extra seconds that could save your life. Silence your cell phone the ringer, the vibration, hide behind large objects or lay on the, or lay flat on the ground on the floor. If there's a shootout between the police and that shooter, most buildings, most rooms are made out of sheetrock and those bullets will go right through the walls. So get low to the ground and remain very quiet. Turn TVs, radios off, computers off. And if someone, if you're in the room and all of a sudden you hear this, Police, we're here to evacuate you. Do not go to that door. Think about it. Are the police really going to knock on a door and say, hey, we're the police. If you're the shooter, shoot us first before we shoot you. They're not going to do that. Understand the police officer's job is to stop the shooter. That's their main objective. They're not there to evacuate people, and they're not there to tend to the injured. You know, Penn Police, every year they do active shooter training and they'll get students from the University of Penn and the students really get into it. They'll get makeup and, and fake blood and all this kind of stuff. Looks like, a, you know, looks like Halloween. And, you know, one of, the, one of the problems is when the police are going through an area of an active shooter, they... A lot, a lot of times they, they could be stepping over children, bodies to get at that shooter. And the, the, the students are trained by the police department that if an officer gets close to you, grab that officer's pants and tell them, save me, save me, I'm bleeding to death. And that officer has to be strong. And, and, and some of these officers have kids the same age. 
it, it, it's devastating for the officers, even to do this training. And, and they have to step over that person in order to get to that shooter so he doesn't harm anybody else. And so um, it, it really is, it, it really, even, even the training is a tragedy when, when, when you're doing this type of thing. So it's run, hide, and then fight. As a last resort, and only if your life is in imminent danger is when you're going to fight. Now, you know, the word fight is kind of tricky. I mean, how many people in, the, in, 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 in this Zoom was in a fight? You know, I mean, I was, I was born and raised in Philadelphia and South Philadelphia, kind of a tough area, and I've had fights. But I'm not talking about those kind of fights. I'm talking about a fight for your life. That is different. That is not fighting over a parking space. You know, it, it, it is a fight for your life. And so what I like to tell people is, you know, think about your family, your loved ones at home. You want to see them. They want to see you again. And you're going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Now, again, I mean, let me repeat, you're not looking for the shooter. You know, this is only if that if that person is coming to you and is get, getting ready to, to harm you. These four checkpoints attempt to incapacitate the shooter, act with physical aggression, improvise weapons, commit to your actions. And we, we learned that 9-11 in 2001 on Flight 93, you know, th those passengers were getting information from their loved ones that planes were crashing into New York and into Washington. And this plane is going to crash too. And you have to take it over. You have to do something. And homework assignment number two for you, wherever you work, look for weapons. Most places you can't take a weapon. You can't take a knife. You can't take a gun like at, at my facility. You can't do that. But I tell staff all the time, look for weapons. They're here. Just look for them. I mean, in a hospital, an IV pole is a nasty weapon. I've seen patients grab a hold of them and like completely destroy a patient room with an IV pole. Um, you know, on 9-11, they use knives and forks, hot water. They use the steel flight attendant's cart to crash into the cockpit to get into where the terrorists were flying the plane. And it's the same thing. Wherever you work, look for items. What, 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 probably one of the best, best ones is a fire extinguisher. You know, a fire extinguisher is, is a heavy steel cylinder. I don't know if you ever, you know, we, we used to do a lot of training with fire extinguishers. And you, when you spray that powder, you know, you could be two blocks away. If the wind hits that powder, you can actually taste it on your tongue from two blocks away. Just imagine spraying that in the face of somebody. They won't be able to see or breathe. And when they bend down to cough that chemical out of their lungs, what do you have in your hands? You have that heavy steel cylinder and use it in order to escape and get out of there. Again, commit to your actions. And that, is there any questions at all for me? You know, I, I know when, when we talk about active shooter, it is uh, not a fun type of uh, program, you know, and, and, and I, I always tell people, you don't want to live in fear. You know, I mean, when I go to a restaurant, I'll sit down at a restaurant and, it, and it's just natural for me. I'll sit down and I observe. I, I, and one of the first things I do, I look for, if I enter this way, where is there another exit to get out? You know, and the reason why I do that is because a couple of things. One, you know, if there's a fire, you could get out quick. If there's a fight, you could get out quick. Active shooter, you could get out. But the most important reason is because if the food is really bad and you don't want to pay for the food, there's another way of sneaking out in the back. I mean, that, that's important too. So um, are there any questions at, at all with um, either workplace violence or, or active shooter? So I was just going to um, ask, thank you, um, number one, for talking about that. That, that was um, really, really a lot of information, a lot of powerful information for all of us. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what um, businesses can do 
to help train their employees. Um, you know, I know, you know, we have an elaborate training program, but, you know, other smaller businesses, what can they do on a smaller scale to help prepare their employees for? Yeah, you know. I can tell you that, that, that there's a lot of information on the internet on, on, on how to prepare and how, how to protect your staff. Um, and, 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 and the, the first thing to do is really do an assessment. You, you have to assess your area of where you're working. If you have, if you have staff that work late at night, and they're by themselves. How could you? How, how are you going to check on check on them? How, how, what what tools can you give them in order to make sure they have a, a cell phone that they could call the police? Um, and in in whatever area, even if you don't have security in a certain building, ask the police to assist and help. And, and when they patrol, that they, they can stop. And, and especially if you have somebody who's working late at night. Um, but th there are consultants out there that will come in and evaluate and do an assessment of, of your location. But it, a lot of it is, is common sense too. You know, I mean, we, we, you know, at, at the hospital, uh, you know, we, we have a certain amount of security officers and, and, and our, our area is like, we're like eight, eight million square feet, you know? So th those officers that we have can't, provide security for that entire area so you have to you have to really train your staff on being proactive and being a part of your security team and so you want to educate your, your your staff on what to do in the event these things could happen you know and a lot of information is on the internet um if um i mean are, are, are most of the companies out there that do you, do you have security at your facilities or no? Is there? No, we, we don't, um, where, uh, where I work. Um, and it's interesting because I, a lot of what you said has kind of got me thinking now because um, I know in, in the past at a different position that I was at, I actually had somebody steal my wallet and I was just a trusting person. You know, I didn't um, secure my purse someplace. It was on the back of my chair. And um, so I became aware at that point. And now I'm thinking of where I work now. Um, we've had to have a lot of temporary employees come in. So maybe they're not getting the same screening that we had and we don't know them as well. So um, I think kind of looking out for each other, I think I'm definitely going to go to work and kind of mention to people, you know, maybe you want to tuck your purse away for a while. And yeah. um, uh, until something like that happens, you don't realize how much havoc that can cause in your life. Also having to replace, you know, your license, your ID, your credit cards, it's like everything is taken. So um, oh, yeah. And, and, and one of the things with that is if you take the opportunity away, you're not going to have that theft. So you're right. You know, you, know, you want to make sure that staff have a safe location where they could secure it, you know? And if they don't, you know, the employer has to find something for them, you know, it, whether it's a locker or a locked desk. And, and so that, that's really important. Take that opportunity away. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you again. Um, anyone else have questions about, um, there was a lot of information and a lot of really good information, I think, um, I, again, has me thinking, anyone else's thoughts on um, security where you work, especially, I mean, some people may be working from home. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, it's great to keep those things in, um, you know, in, in your forethought, when, when you're going to work and when you're observing your workplace and uh, observing, you know, the challenges that you could potentially have, you know, just because you haven't had them in the past doesn't mean they're not going to happen in the future. So, you know, you can't just rely on what what has gone wrong in the past. And that, that's what, you know, I think I'm really going to do when I go to work tomorrow, probably after this is, you know, try to identify some of those things. You know, what are the potential risks? Um you know, what, what, what do we have in our, you know, possession that we can use to thwart those risks or face them when they happen? So it's just, yeah, it's great to, um, 
be aware of those things so you can start thinking about them. Yeah, and and, and be and, and, and be proactive. I, I I know that there are a lot of tools out there, especially in de-escalation techniques. You know, there's there's we, we utilize CPI, that's Crisis Prevention Institute. There there's something called MOAP, Management of Aggressive Behavior. There's Verbal Judo, and all all these and they're all very similar. You know, and and it 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 it, it, ha- it helps the employee. To, a, to identify if a person is starting to escalate and how to de-escalate that person. And, and, and that is, especially in your business, it, it, it's good to have that, have that training, that tool to de-escalate a situation. You know, so uh, that, that, that is an, an extremely important part of, of anyone's job to try to avoid workplace violence. It's de-escalated before it becomes a, a problem. Right. Yeah. Especially verbal abuse that happens actually quite frequently. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure it happens a lot in your business too. You know, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, there's always, you know, somebody who has a complaint about something and, you know, some of them get more aggressive with it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Appreciate yes. that. Th- thank you. Th- thanks for inviting me. Well, thank you so much. We're we're coming up on that eight o'clock time. Um, if anyone has any other quick questions, um, let us know. Again, a reminder, keep checking into the website um, for NCA. And uh, as soon as um, our convention is, is open, make sure you're registering. And if you have any questions, um, you can feel free to uh, contact um, the info at NCA. Um, they'll be able to assist you there. And just a heads up to people also, it, we're coming into our awards season. So keep that in the back of your mind. Again, go to our website, check out and see what awards you may be um, able to receive this year. And uh, keep your eyes open for emails about that as well. Um, Anyone else have any comments? And Joseph, again, thank you so much. Um, very interesting, and uh, it it was wonderful you wonderful for you to take the time this evening to um, to meet with us. And we're all going to be going to work and looking for weapons and ways out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, it was a wonderful presentation. Really informative. Thank you. Thank you, and and be be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you also. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.